As we begin the service, I would ask if any of you have a cell phone or any other noise-making device, please turn them off at this time. Officiating the service here today is Rabbi Rene Dickman. We're going to begin the service here today with active duty personnel from the United States Army presenting the flag to Mrs. Burkoon.
Birth is a beginning and death a destination. And life is a journey from childhood to maturity and youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength or from strength to weakness and often back again, from health to sickness and we pray to health again, from offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion, from grief to understanding, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat, until not looking backwards or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high point along the way, but in having made the journey, step by step, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, and life is a journey. The montage that you saw before the service began was created by Norman's nephew, Ben Rose, and the music was played by Lorraine's cousin, Amy Dorfman. Norman Burkoon was a mensch among menches. There is so much to say about him. His quiet generosity, his integrity, his love and commitment to his family, his musicality, his work ethic, his leadership, his friendship, his hospitality, his self-reflection, his careful planning, and sage advice. Norman was a constant. He was a reliable source of support, of family history, and always good wishes for all of us. He lived a long life. He accomplished a great deal, and he helped all of us feel connected to him and to each other. His death is a tremendous loss to our family, but we could not expect him to live forever, even though we might have wanted that for ourselves. Let us give thanks for his long and meaningful life and for all the blessings he bestowed upon us and upon his family. Today we have gathered to remember all that was good in his life and the goodness that he brought to the lives of so many. We have also gathered to bring comfort to those who are hurting the most. We are here for you, and we pledge to remember Norman in our hearts and in our deeds. Several relatives will be speaking about him today. So first I call upon Norman and Lorraine's grandson, Nathan. For those of you who I have not yet met, my name is Nathan Berg. I am a grandson of Norman through my mother, Joan. It was with much sadness to hear about my grandpa's passing almost two weeks ago. Though I was aware of his declining health, there is no sensible way to prepare oneself for a loss of someone so important and influential in their life. You see, my grandpa was always there. Growing up in San Diego, my grandparents would spend several months time during the winter at our home. Over the last couple of days, I've been trying to recall some of my earliest memories with my grandpa. Sometime around maybe first grade, I remember we were in our kitchen at the table and he was helping me with my spelling homework. I remember vividly the concerned look on his face and his sense of hysteria when I couldn't spell for him the word of O F. In order to convincingly ensure him that I was capable, it was probably then that I decided to go to engineering and medical school. To this day, I frequently recall that moment whenever I spell the word. While on their winter stay in San Diego, my grandparents would spend some time at a beachfront rental where my brother and I would often spend the night with them. We typically celebrate his birthday uh, with dinner and cake at our house. My grandparents were there so much in part of our lives I'm pretty sure that my brother and I used to refer to the guest room where they would stay at our house as grandma and grandpa's room. Later, while I was at school in Michigan, their home in Chicago became the closest thing to home for me. I probably spent more time there in a five-year span than I did in California. 
Having spent so much time with my grandpa, I have become increasingly aware of how much he has influenced me. I wouldn't be the same person pursuing the same endeavors that I have if I had not been for him. We would speak at great lengths about current events and ethics, about the hardships of people we barely knew, about the sports teams that consistently disappointed us, about how things are now and how they were then during his youth. Our conversations could be deep or trivial, but they were always sincere and meaningful. When you were around grandpa, you could feel that there were, you were in the presence of someone that cared so much about other people. I probably speak on behalf of anyone who knew him when I say that he genuinely was a friend to all. He's helped me so many times in times of need, whether it be for words of advice, a companion to talk to, or dealing with the loss of a loved one. He has touched us all in some way. getting some messages about speaking out of turn. I think I'll just finish. I'd like to lastly say that I feel so lucky to have had him as my grandpa. He was a devoted husband and father, a reliable and endearing friend, a patriotic serviceman, and he was my second father and a role model I'll continue to look up to. Thank you so much for everything, Grandpa. You will be lovingly missed and joyfully remembered. Thank you. Norman, Norman was, was a very, very nice, everybody, everything that's said about Norman is true and there's not much more that can be said about Norman. He was nice to everybody that, that he knew and even that he didn't know. And especially to my mother, he was very nice. Uh, he, was, he was a wonderful person. And like I said before, he was more than a cousin. He was like a big brother to me. I can remember way back in 1945 when my mother took me and my brother to Los Angeles for a few months and we stayed with, uh, with, the, his, with his mother and Ruthie and his father. And I, for some other re, for some reason or other, and that's many years ago, the address that they lived at sticks in my mind. It was like 455 Genesee, and I always remember that address. And I and Norman, I, I saw Norman at the time because he was still in the army, and uh, he came home from leave at the time, and so I, I remember that very well for some reason or other, and. Uh, and then he, he, after the army, he came back to Chicago and he, I can remember him taking me to a Cub game and sitting in the bleachers. It's just little things like that that stick in your mind. And he did everything for me and my brother and my mother. As it was, I lost my father at a young age. He was always there for us if we needed anything. You could ask anything of Norman and he would be there right away. He was always there for us. And all I can say is, God bless you, Norman. We love you. Hi, everybody. My name is Brian Lebo. I'm here with my wife, Kat Wellman, because Norman, in the last dozen or so years, turned into a very important person for us. Norman was a cousin and best friend to my dad, Julius Lebo, when they were kids. And even though my dad ended up in California, they kept that status throughout the decades. When my dad died in 2007, I knew of Norman, but I didn't know him. Then he wrote me a letter about his memories with my father. In my grief, that letter and Norman himself was a tangible connection to my father and also gave me such a special opportunity to get to know Norman and Lorraine. They invited me and my wife, Kat, to stay with them anytime we were in Chicago. And also during the winter sojourns, they had been taking to Coronado Island in San Diego. 
to visit their daughter, Joan, and her family. One more blessing to meeting Norman and Lorraine, by the way, was the close friendship we have developed with Joan, who is loved by everyone in our family. We visited Norman and Lorraine probably over a dozen times over the next 12 or 13 years. He, and Lorraine as well, was unfailingly generous, good-natured, talkative, a voracious reader of a dozen magazines and periodicals, and a political junkie who was knowledgeable and opinionated about local, national, and world affairs. CNN or NSNBC was always on that kitchen TV, and there was always a container of mixed nuts for me to nosh on too. Thank you, Lorraine. Did I say Norman was generous? It was exceedingly difficult to pick up the check whenever we went out to dinner. Once I was determined to do so, when we entered the restaurant, I took the maitre d' aside almost immediately and told him I would pick up the check, no matter what the older gentleman at the table said. The maitre d' told me he has already beaten you to it. Norman was health conscious and resilient and active until the end. He was also great behind the wheels of an automobile. Well into his 90s, I felt comfortable being a passenger in his car, no lie. He loved classical music. Whenever we visited, he would be humming one classical riff after another. He and Lorraine spoiled us by taking us to the Chicago Symphony. They insisted, of course, that we sit in the better seats. I also want to recognize Norman was part of the greatest generation, the generation that grew up in the Depression, fought in World War II, bore witness to the Holocaust. Norman was an artillery spotter in the European theater. The soldiers he fought with became close friends for life. As Norman takes up residence in our memories, I want to emphasize, and Norman would agree, that we learned hard truths in that era, truths that sadly are under attack by tens of millions of Americans today. Most importantly, Norman was an extremely kind and loving person. He loved his wife, children, and grandchildren more than anything. He always talked about them. My wife, Kat, and I, as well as my mother-in-law, Doreen, we're lucky to be the recipients of Norman and Lorraine's loving kindness, and we are eternally grateful. We all miss him so much. May he rest in peace. Thank you. I call upon Norman and Lorraine's nephew, Ben Rose, who's here with us. I moved to Chicago in 1992. Before that, I'd been here in Chicago many, on many times on visits, and I knew my Uncle Norman through those visits and through occasional family get-togethers elsewhere. I was excited to move to Chicago at the time, and there were many good reasons to be here. But one of the unintended and truly positive consequences was getting to know Norman so much better. When our children were little, we had many opportunities to come up to Skokie and visit for brunch, for dinner, sometimes just to say hi. Lorraine and Norman would also drive to the city every so often to visit us. If family were in town or if we were hosting a, a family event, I always looked forward to those occasions and to the inevitable phone call from Norman that would come about 48 hours ahead of time to discuss the parking situation. I admit to being a bit surprised that this man who had braved sniper fire in Germany seemed so completely terrified at the prospect of finding a parking space in Chicago. But we helped, we helped him out with that and we're happy to do so. Another thing that struck me about Norman was his definition of family. He had close relatives, of course, his in-laws, 
but it seemed to me he extended the definition of family to pretty much anyone who is even remotely connected to him, whether by blood, marriage, or friendship. Everyone was welcome, treated with generosity, and Norman took an interest in them all. He never ever failed to ask about our children as they grew up and even left home, or my parents, or my in-laws, even at the end. Truly, it has been a privilege to spend so much time with Norman, listening to stories about his army service, his childhood, his colorful clients, and so much more. He was one of the most astute observers and wisest people I've ever known. He was engaging, kind, concerned, and had a wry sense of humor that I'll miss dearly. Thank you, Norman, for being a part of my life. Rest in peace. We'll wait a moment for the video of Rhonda, Norman's daughter-in-law in Atlanta. Right? Atlanta. Okay. I would never be able to read this without crying. So I have asked my wife, Rhonda, to read this for me. I find it extremely difficult to share some words with you about my dad because I am so saddened by his passing. And even though he was almost 97, his passing was totally unexpected to me. I say this because often the normal progression of life is that parents have kids, the parents raise and take care of the kids, and the kids grow up, the parents get older, and the kids take care of the parents. While I certainly got older, it always seemed to me that my parents never did. My mom can still run as fast as she could the day I met her, and my dad was riding his bicycle into his 70s. Although the topics changed, my conversations with my folks had a similar tone and feel throughout my life. I never had a conversation with either of my parents and felt like their mental capacities had diminished. Sure, my dad had some medical issues, but he always bounced back. I remember once while in his 90s, he drove himself to the hospital after midnight for a heart problem, telling me it was easy. There was no traffic. My dad took classes at Oakton Community College into his 90s, and the class had a birthday cake for him when he was 90 or 92. So as you can see, the only one who got older was me, and it seemed I was going to pass them by in age. So although I'm making a few wise cracks while I wallow in my sadness, I consider myself beyond lucky that at age 60 and a half, I had 60 and a half quality years with my dad, although I selfishly want 60 more. My dad always worked hard, but he always spent quality time with Joni and me when we were growing up. Just teaching Joni to drive took a while, a lot of quality time. My dad was a very good softball player, and from age six, when he bought me a baseball mitt and ball, my dad and I played catch or hit my fly balls at the park almost every weekend in the summer. We were still playing catch through my high school years, and I never had to let up on how hard I threw to him. My dad was always supportive of my athletic pursuits and both my parents regularly attended my games. I don't recall my mom ever missing one of the little league baseball games or any grade school or high school basketball games that were played within 15 miles of the house. And my dad never missed any night or weeknight games. Throughout my school years, my folks always knew Joni and my friends, the classes we were taking and what we did after school, etc. 
One of the best times of the day through my high school days was dinner. We ate as a family almost every Sunday through Friday until Joni went to college two years before I did. Our dinners were nonstop chatter and laughing and there was always dessert. Sometimes our mom brought home a cake from a bakery from Devon Avenue or from Oakton Street. But I never remember a cake surviving overnight, which brings to mind the salesman in the boys section of Marshall Field saying to my mom, let's take a walk with your son to the Husky section. But that's a story for another time. My dad's dedication to his family and friends has no limits. There was never something he talked about or felt was an obligation or a chore or a burden. Helping family and friends in need, whether it was money, advice, comfort, or time, was a part of my dad's inner fabric and engraved culture, and my mom as well. When my dad helped someone, there was never a quid pro quo. You never owed him one back. My mom and dad never looked for thank yous. They just hoped their efforts would resolve the person's problems. My dad spent a lot of time guiding me throughout my life, and he never used an iron fist. When my first high school grades were less than stellar, he never said, get those grades up or you're grounded. As time went on, he saw me make decisions he didn't agree with, and he never said, why did you do that? You should have done that. And he never told me what decisions I should make. My dad's way was to present his thoughts that would provide me information or insights that would allow me to make a decision like, your grades are fine, but if you have any thoughts about getting into the University of Illinois, you might want to look at the average grades for their admitted students. Throughout my school years and my career, I always felt that my dad was behind me, even when I knew he did not always agree with my decisions. He never gave me, I told you so. My mom and dad provided Joan and me with a great example of a loving and caring relationship in which I always saw an even balance of respect and love. I never felt either of my parents dominated their relationship. And I can honestly say that the only arguments I can recall between them were the few times my mother, who was a great cook, over grilled steaks because my dad was a staunch, medium rare guy. And when my mom wasn't dressed on time to leave for the symphony, wedding, or some other social event, which of course was a bit unfair because my dad never had to spend time on his hair. Again, my kidding aside, I know my dad felt he had a great life and he loved living it and especially his wife. After getting married, he loved having my mom as his partner in life. He loved working hard and making his way to a successful career for which he started a firm which he was effectively the managing partner for, for several years. He loved his many aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, and cousins, and my mom's brother, Uncle Henry. He had many close long-term friends. His clients were much more to him than just business. I knew many of them growing up, and he cared for them and their businesses like they were family. However, my dad never forgot his moral compass or ethical code in his personal and business life. He walked away from several potential clients that were looking for a CPA that would stretch the tax laws too far. When Joan and I got married, dad welcomed Rick and Rhonda into his family as son and daughter and I knew my dad suffered a loss so sudden when Rick sadly passed away at age 50. 
My dad's first grandchildren were Joni's boys, Nathan and Evan, who are 29 and 26. Although Joan lived in San Diego, my folks spent as much time out there as they could. And in time, my folks stayed in San Diego for five weeks or so for several winters. My dad was so proud of Nathan, who graduated from the University of Michigan, that the day Nathan enrolled, my dad started wearing a Michigan hat. And I saw that hat for years until one time I picked my dad up from the airport in Atlanta in 2017 when he was 93. And I noticed he was wearing a World War II veterans hat and walking with a cane. I asked about it as I was putting his suitcase in the trunk of the car and my dad said to me, Mark, I noticed that when I wear this hat and use a cane when I go to the airport, the people at the boarding gate let mom and me board first and I can usually change to better seats. Then he proceeded to toss the cane and the hat into the trunk and pulled out his Michigan hat and walked to get into the car. My dad was equally as proud of Evan as, as he completed his engineering degree from the University of San Diego. But my dad only had one head and the Michigan hat stayed. When Ron and I had three girls, it was a bit of a change for my dad. Although Isabella is 10 and seven years younger than Nathan and Evan, I think Bella talked my folks ears off more by age four then Nathan and Evan had spoken it all at, their, at that point in time. Then when Olivia and Shelby came along and soon joined Bella's, so to speak, choir, my dad's joy and love for my girls continued to grow, and especially as he secretly turned down his hearing aid. But all kidding aside, my mom and dad made regular trips to Atlanta and saw their granddaughter's bat mitzvahs, and I know my kids love and miss their grandpa very much. I often told my kids how lucky they were to have my mom and dad loving and looking out for them so much. Rhonda and my dad developed their own special relationship that you'd like to touch upon separately. So I apologize for going on for so long in my mind and heart, I am not even one tenth the way through expressing my feelings for my dad. I take some comfort knowing that my dad knew how I felt about him and how appreciative I was for everything he and my mom did for me and my family. I told him many times because I never wanted to feel, I never got a chance to tell him before it was too late. And I thank my mom for everything as well. So I say goodbye to all of you for now, but I will never say goodbye to my dad as he will always be with me. Dad, I love you. On a personal note, Norman was not just a father-in-law. He became a father to me. His guidance, advice, mentoring, and support were always present. And as the years passed, our relationship only grew deeper and stronger. I always admired his strength, stamina, dedication, and I regularly expressed my gratitude and love to him and Lorraine. I'll greatly miss our conversations on politics, family, and a myriad of other topics but I will miss him. Norman, you are forever loved and will always be in all of our hearts. Norman wrote an autobiography, which is a great gift to his family. And he begins with these words. Speaking of inconsequential events, I was born on January 13th, 1924, in Milwaukee's Mount Sinai Hospital. It might have been an inconsequential event that day, but certainly his life was anything but. 
He describes his bris saying, while I lay suffering, the crowd was eating all kinds of traditional Jewish foods like there was no tomorrow. Throughout his childhood, Norman moved many times. He went to a lot of different schools and he had so many different jobs by the time he was a young man. His work ethic and commitment to his family was evident from a very young age. His earliest memory was the birth of his sister, Ruth, in the American Hospital on Irving Park Boulevard in Chicago. His aunt, Rhea, who was seven at the time, snuck him up a back stairway to visit his mother, Sarah. Norman spoke only Yiddish until he started school. He had fond memories of the other family who lived in their two flat on Emerald Avenue. They only spoke Lithuanian, but somehow the two families became great friends. When Norman started kindergarten at Healy School, his mother sat in the class for a few weeks as an interpreter. From then on, English became the household language. For a short time, Sarah, Norman, and Ruth lived with Aunt Ida and Uncle Nate in Waukegan, and then Norman's grandparents on the west side of Chicago. In that apartment, Norman described, lived his grandparents, his great-grandmother, four aunts, four uncles, Sarah, Ruth, and Norman. Aunt Rhea walked Norman back and forth to school each day. Norman wrote, I recall that my grandmother, despite her artificial leg, navigated to cook for the entire bunch for virtually every meal. She was in the kitchen almost all the time and did most of the shopping. Friday meant cooking gefilte fish, chicken and soup, noodles from scratch, baking bread and various cakes and cookies. All of this on one stove. Norman then moved back to Evanston and went to school there from fourth through half of seventh grade. There were no, no more than four other Jewish families with children at Oakton Elementary School. Norman recalled kids who taunted him and a mother who didn't want her son to play baseball with Norman because he was Jewish. There were not very many Jewish families in Evanston in the 20s and 30s. The Burkuns were quite close with a few other Jewish families, the Jacobsons and the Sobels. In fourth grade, Norman attended a school assembly where he heard the school band play. He asked his parents if he could play the trumpet, but his father convinced him to take up the clarinet instead. From then on, the clarinet played a major role in his life, and he played his first solo at age nine, standing on a chair. In the middle of seventh grade in December of 1935, Norman's family moved to Buffalo, New York, where his father's parents lived, and then on to Olean, New York, where his Aunt Rose and her family lived, and back again to Buffalo. Through all of his moves and all the different schools he attended, his family's financial ups and downs, Norman remembers the lifelong friends he made along the way. In January of 37, Norman celebrated his bar mitzvah in the synagogue where his grandfather served as the cantor. His maternal grandmother came from Chicago with shopping bags of baked goods. This chapter in Buffalo was a good one, filled with many cousins, aunts, uncles, and friends. Norman attended high school in Olean, where his life revolved around the school band and his friends in the Jewish community of B'nai Israel. In his junior year, Norman and a few others were invited to join the band at St. Bonaventure, a small college in Olean. Back in 1934, Norman had played at the Chicago World's Fair with his elementary school band. And in 1941, he played with the St. Bonaventure Band at the New York World Fair. A day or two before he was to leave to start college at St. Bonaventure on a four-year scholarship, Norman's father had a heart attack 
and was no longer able to work in the restaurant the family owned. He was only 46 at the time. So instead of college, Norman went to work in the restaurant. And then when the family moved back to Chicago, Norman worked in a tool shop. Then when his father needed to live somewhere warmer, the family moved to Los Angeles. There, Norman and his father worked in a uniform cap shop, and they were able to make ends meet. They shared one car, trading it at two in the morning between their different shifts. In June of 1943, Norman reported to Fort MacArthur near LA. He wrote, I had not gone past high school when I went into the service, but I was able to teach some sergeants and a few lieutenants some basic trigonometry, which is used for plotting positions and targets, employing surveyors, tools, and methods. This helped me politically and I gradually gained some respect. It also got me the job of forward observer. Jones, I, and Lieutenant Anderson were a team unto ourselves and had some interesting and a few harrowing experiences. Our battalion finally got into the lines in December of 44, just before the Battle of the Bulge began. Fortunately, we were kept in a holding position and were spared the casualties, the heavy casualties, other outfits suffered. Starting in January of 45, we started moving almost continuously, setting up the guns on a moment's notice when needed. Jones, Lieutenant Anderson, and I crossed the Rhine with the infantry in small outboard boats. We carried heavy radios and directed artillery fire as the infantry commander requested. It proved to be about the worst three or four days of our lives, but we all escaped injury and were relieved by a few other fellows from our outfit. We all received bronze stars for our frightful encounter. By then the German army was disintegrating and by late March, heavy opposition in our sector was sporadic and the lines were fluid. Many enemy positions were bypassed and they surrendered by the thousands. Toward the end, I sustained a minor injury to my back and was hospitalized for a short time. By the time I got back to my outfit, the war was over and we were sent to Austria as occupation troops. Duties were minimal and it was almost a vacation. In late July, we started training again to go to the Pacific, a very depressing development. We learned of the dropping of the atomic bomb with disbelief. It meant and and elation. It meant no more training and residence for five months on the outskirts of Salzburg. They were a happy five months. By December, most of us had enough points to go home. A few of us were transferred to the 26th Division for the trip back. After a few weeks in France and three or four days in Paris, we went to Marseille to board a Liberty ship to leave for the US. On the ship, I ran into my friend from Chicago, Art Witkov a supply sergeant with an artillery battalion. He and I had met in Salzburg for Rosh Hashanah services that September. Then home we go only to hit a storm in the Atlantic that made history. About 90% were seasick and each day seemed like an eternity. The ship bounced like a cork for nine days and I thought the end was upon us. Anyhow, one afternoon we spotted Norfolk, Virginia and all of a sudden all the sick guys got well and lined the deck. We landed Christmas Day, 1945, went to the mess hall for turkey and trimmings and ate like a famine was approaching. From there, we all split up, most going to the West Coast on a troop train. I applied for discharge in Fort Dix, New Jersey, with the story that I had a job opportunity in New York City. They granted my wish and gave me five cents a mile to Los Angeles. After three days in New York with my aunt and uncle, I went to Buffalo, Olean, Chicago, and finally home on the Super Chief, end of my army career. And you can see the picture that's here. He's holding a picture of himself in the army. Well, the GI Bill paid for him to, to attend DePaul, and he learned accounting and 
a mutual friend of Norman and Lorraine's named Izzy Earl, introduced them. And he wrote, it was 1952 and we had a nice Thanksgiving dinner in a quiet restaurant and decided on a summer wedding. That weekend, I bought a ring from an uncle in the business and we announced our engagement. At the time, my mother lived in Chicago. Once I broke the news to her, it was like telling the Associated Press. In a couple of hours, my aunts put together a party and in short order, Lorraine was initiated into the asylum, he wrote. We had a very nice wedding in a pleasant hotel in Buffalo and then left for our honeymoon by auto to Niagara Falls, Ontario, Toronto, and onto a popular Jewish resort called Mus Muskoga Lodge. The setting was most pleasant and we met several Buffalonians that Lorraine knew. At that time, the area was barren and sparsely populated. Today, they have traffic jams. He also wrote, as for me, I can't imagine anyone else who would put up with my idiosyncrasies, and I am grateful for Lorraine's patience, love, and guidance. Another plus, she has always been a very attentive, encouraging, but unintrusive mother. I think our kids know how lucky they have been to grow up with her quiet guidance. In a note to me, he described Lorraine as a quiet giant. We give thanks for all the years that you were able to spend together. And we're here to comfort you, Lorraine, in this time of mourning for your beloved Norman. I know that Norman had many first cousins, one of whom was my father. Norman was about 20 years older than my dad. And Norman shared with me some stories about babysitting for my dad, an image that I will hold in my heart for a very long time. There's so much more to say about Norman, his work as a CPA, his profound integrity, his sage advice, and his generosity. And so I ask that everyone who loved Norman, all of his family and his friends, will over the next weeks and months share many more of these stories with Joan and with Lorraine. I'm going to call upon Joan, who has a few words to share. I'm going to say a few words that Ken Hoffman has written about my dad. It goes, I will always remember Norman as a kind, considerate, thoughtful, and generous man, full of love for Lorraine, family, and friends. A man from very modest beginnings who became quite successful. He was entertaining and engaging, always interested in how you were doing and offering advice when needed. He was especially loyal to my family during my father's many illnesses and ultimate death and always concerned about my mother's well-being, for which I am grateful. Norman was a wonderful person whom I will always love, respect, and miss. And may I say, Ken, my mom and I will be forever grateful for all the driving you did for my dad, taking him to doctor appointments and picking him up from many hospital visits. You are also a kind, thoughtful cousin we are lucky to have in our family. Then, I was gonna say good afternoon. There are many friends and relatives here with us from coast to coast, and a few overseas with us virtually. My mom and I thank each and every one of you for being with us. My dad wanted to thank all of you too. That was one line in the many handwritten notes he left me. He also left an outline of his life long enough to write a short book. As most of you know, Norman always planned for the future, wanting to make things as smooth as possible. For many years, my parents spent nearly eight weeks in the winter with or near my family in San Diego. As they arranged to rent a condo in Coronado each January, 
dad would remind me that they were spending my inheritance. Well, it was worth every penny as they became closer with my husband, Rick, and saw their grandsons grow up. My parents were there to help my sons and me during Rick's illness and after he passed. Dad guided me with clear-headed advice, both financial and personal. This year was very different and lonely for almost all of us. I flew back here in January. Yes, I would regularly brave the cold to be with dad for his 96th birthday. I flew in during the winter most years lately for his or my mom's winter birthdays. In fact, I was here every three to five months until the pandemic took hold. I waited more than seven months to return in September and again in November for two more memorable visits with mom and dad. I am so glad I was able to visit so often. And special thanks to all of the speakers for sharing their memories with us. Many thanks to the Chicago Fun Jewish Funerals for their professionalism and compassion. Thank you, Mom, for your love and attention to Dad. You kept track of his many, a doctor, many doctor appointments and stressed through many hospitalizations. And thank you, Rabbi Rini Dickman, for your recent efforts to get to know my dad better. He enjoyed getting to know you too. Our memorial is so very extra special with you presiding here today. This is a poem called, We Remember Them, but I'm going to change it to We Remember Him. At the rising of the sun and at its going down, we remember him. At the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember him. At the opening of the buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember him. At the blueness of the skies and in the warmth of summer, we remember him. At the rustling of the leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we remember him. At the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember him. As long as we live, he too will live, for he is now a part of us as we remember him. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember him. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember him. When we have joy we crave to share, we remember him. When we have decisions that are difficult to make, we remember him. When we have achievements that are based on his, we remember him. As long as we live, he too shall live, for he is now a part of us as we remember him. I'll ask you to rise for the mourner's cottage, which is on the back of the booklet they gave you. Yit kadal v'yit kadash shemei rabba b'alma divra chirute v'amlich malchute b'chayechon u'v'yomechon u'v'chaye d'chol beit Yisrael ba'agala u'v'izman kari v'imru amen yehi shemei rabba mevorach le'olam olomeo maya yit barach v'yishtabach v'yipar v'yitromam v'yitnase Viet hadar viet alev viet alal shemei dikud sha berichu leela min kol birchata veshirata tush bechata venechamata da amiran bialma vimru amen yehi shlama raba min shemaya vechayim alenu veal kol yisrael vimru amen ose shalom bimromav hu ya ase shalom alenu veal kol yisrael vimru amen. Hamakom yenachem etchem betoch sha'ar of Zion vi Rushalayim. May God grant you comfort among all the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. May his memory be a blessing, and may you be comforted in the days ahead. Amen.
This concludes the service here in our chapel. We'd like to thank all of those that are watching remotely for attending today. I'd also like to make sure those who are watching remotely are aware the family has asked that memorial contributions in Mr. Burkun's name be made to the Jewish United Fund and the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. For those of you uh, present today with us, it's on the inside portion of the funeral service folder you should have received. For those of you watching online, that information is available on the website that you are on right now. In just a few moments, we will be terminating the live feed to the service. Thank you.